Sometimes during my workday, I get a little sad. And this usually corresponds to me feeling overwhelmed by how much I still have to do to finish my PhD, or worrying that I'll never get to the end of it, or that I'm actually just incapable of finishing it. And it is exactly moments like that when retail therapy has helped me. Now, retail therapy is not actually therapy, and I am not a medical professional. In fact, I'm not really a professional at all yet, so don't go to me for help for any issues that you might have. This video is purely for entertainment purposes only, kind of like retail therapy. Retail therapy is when you go shopping because you feel sad to make yourself happier and feel like you are more in control of life and get that dopamine hit when you are anticipating getting a treat by buying something. This can lead to problematic spending habits because usually when you go shopping for retail therapy, what you get are just comfort buys. So you shouldn't partake in retail therapy if you don't comfortably have enough Enough money to do so, but in that case you could just window shop because that still gives you the release of dopamine at looking at the things that you might buy, and it still distracts you from the sadness of your workday and the feelings of overwhelm. Or you could always just use it to shop for things that you were going to buy anyway. Retail therapy can also lead to disordered shopping habits because buying things can be quite addictive, and you might end up noticing that you actually feel worse once you've purchased an item. So retail therapy can lead to buyer's remorse. But I am making this video because I think I have found the solution to these issues issues associated with retail therapy in my life, so that I can get the benefits of retail therapy, that hit of dopamine, the distraction from my PhD work, the feeling of control at being able to make your own purchasing decisions and alter your life in some small way, without getting the drawbacks of retail therapy, like spending money and then feeling worse about yourself. And my solution is quite simple. It is to use your public library. My public library lets you take out, apparently, I've never tried this, but apparently you can take out up to a hundred items on your library card. And my library just removed all fines for late books. So going to the library and taking out books literally costs me nothing. Anyway, all that to say, this is a book haul of all the books that I found at the library last week when I was kind of sad during my work day. I don't know if I'll read all of these books. I don't know if I'll read any of these books. My library lets you renew books two times before you have to bring them back, but we'll see. I don't know. If not, then they served their purpose, and I can give them back to the library without guilt because I spent no money on them, and honestly, I can just wait half a year and take them out then again if my brain still really wants to read them at that time. So I'm gonna tell you about the books and why I picked them up, and don't hold me to reading them because honestly, I probably won't. If there's a book in this list that you're like, no, Morgan, you have to read it before returning them to the library, then tell me and maybe I will. But without further ado, here are the books that I found. First of all, Pure Color by Sheila Hetty. I saw Alison Pages talk about this recently and she said she really liked it. Alison Pages is one of my favorite booktube channels, by the way, so if you're looking for other readers to follow, Alison Pages is phenomenal. The thing that she said about this book that made me want to read it is that it was set on a leaf. I don't know if I'm misunderstanding that or if I misheard her or I'm misremembering, but the front cover page uh, is giving me vibes of set on a leaf. So I don't know anything else about this book other than when she mentioned it. I looked it up and Sheila Hetty appears to be a Canadian author and I love supporting fellow Canadians, so I grabbed it. I've never read Sheila Hetty before, but she also has written Motherhood and How Should a Person Be? Next up, we have a long-awaited addition to my reading life, Becky Chambers. Becky Chambers is a sci-fi author. Her trilogy that she wrote prior to 
to be taught if fortunate, won her the Hugo Prize for Best Series, I think. This, To Be Taught If Fortunate, is a novella that she wrote after that trilogy. The tagline for the book is, in the future, instead of terraforming planets to sustain human life, explorers of the galaxy transform themselves. I think my friend Sophie is going to be very happy that I have finally picked up a Becky Chambers. So some of these books, like the two I just mentioned, I had already heard of, and that's why I grabbed them from the library. And that's usually what I find when I go to the library is titles that I've heard mentioned on booktube or I've looked into myself or I'm already aware of in some way and those are the ones I take home. I, I rarely pick up a book that I've never heard of just because it looks good but the other day while I was at the library and just deciding that I was gonna t grab as many books as looked interesting to me just to make myself happy midday, I, I realized why why only grab books that I've heard of before? I mean, it's just the library. If I read the first page and I hate it, I can just return it the next day. So three of these books are books that I have never heard of before and just looked so interesting to me that I, I grabbed them to give them a go. That includes this next book called Hollow by B. Catlin. I've never heard of B. Catlin before. I think he's also a sculptor and a poet and a painter and a performance artist. He's also a professor. He wrote a trilogy called The Vore, which I have never heard of, but I read the back of this book and it sounded like exactly the book that I wanted to be reading right now. Like it was almost uncanny. And the other thing I do is I always go to the new shelves. I, I just like look at the, the four, six, four shelves that my library has, just like in the, in the middle of the library, there's these four shelves, which is all of the new additions to their collection. Really, I just look through those. The rest of the library is too overwhelming. And this was on there and I read the back of the book and I was like, whoa, I want, I want it. Publishers Weekly on the back of the book says, this spellbinding slipstream novel from Catling feels like stepping into one of Hieronymus Bosch's playfully macabre paintings. Apparently there are a lot of mentions of, or like references to Bosch in this book, which is pretty exciting. I saw a circus show that was like co-made by Les Cetois de la Maine a couple years ago that was about Hieronymus Bosch's painting, The Garden of Earthly Delights, and it was fascinating, and I would love to know more about Bosch and investigate his paintings further, so that's kind of interesting. I think Catling is kind of a surrealist author, and honestly, the uh, surrealism of this front cover really grabbed my eye, as well as, um, honestly, the author's name and the way that it's written in this, like, handwritten font. But anyway, I won't read you the whole description. I'll just read you the end. It says, As reality bends, a series of brutal adventures illuminates the nature of fate, beauty, and doom alike. Rich with action and fantastic creatures, Hollow ushers the reader through a world where holy secrets are unearthed, art mirrors life, and death looms over everything. Sounds very, like, surrealist grimdark and... I'm in the mood for it, so I kind of really want to read this. The next one is one that I have heard of. It was shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize last year, so it was kind of on my radar, but um, then I read the description and I, I looked it up online and I definitely think I want to read it. So this is The Son of the House by Chiluchi Onyomolikwe Onobia. I hope I'm pronouncing that somewhat correctly. Chiluchi is a Nigerian author and this book is set in Nigeria. The two main characters of the book are both women. They had different circumstances in their life, but they both end up being kidnapped by a terrorist group, and they are sitting in a dark room together awaiting their fate. I've heard that this author is an amazing writer, and since she was shortlisted for the Giller Prize, I have no doubt that she is, and uh, it sounds like a really fascinating premise, so I'm very interested to pick this one up. This next one is the one that I actually went to the library expecting to pick up, and it is The Courage to be Disliked, the Japanese phenomenon that shows you how to change your life and achieve real happiness by Ichiru Kishimi and Fumitake Koga. I have just seen this book all over YouTube lately, which is kind of weird because I don't think it's a recent publication. Yeah, 2013. And this translated version is 2019. So I don't know why it's suddenly popping up for me all over the place, but I think Ali Abdal recently talked about this and it just sounds like something I need to learn. So I don't think there's much more I can say about it other than I hope it teaches me how to have the courage to be disliked. 
If you saw the reading vlog that I posted last week, hopefully that actually got posted and you know what I'm referring to, then you'll know that I have been reading Brené Brown's book Daring Greatly, and I'm enjoying it so much that I wanted to pick up more Brené Brown, and at the library, near The Courage to be Disliked, I saw Brené Brown's book Braving the Wilderness, The Quest for True Belonging, and The Courage to Stand Alone. And this, this sounds like a very similar premise to Daring Greatly, uh, Courage to Stand Alone and Dare Greatly, sound very similar, uh, so I'm sure that I will also enjoy this book. And I find it super interesting when sort of self-help authors write multiple books and then you read them in order and they refer to their past experiences from previous books and reflect on them in the future books. I read two of Glennon Doyle's books and she sort of did that. And this book was written after Daring Greatly, so I'm, I'm kind of curious to see how Brené Brown reflects on her past experiences that she had written about in Daring Greatly. Next up, we have two that I have never heard of before and picked up because they piqued my interest. The first one is The Temple House Vanishing by Rachel Donahue. Um, and of course at the library, all of the books are on the shelf like this. So like the first thing that is going to catch your eye is the spine of the book. And it's really the spine of this book that grabbed my attention because it's called Temple House Vanishing and the words are literally vanishing and blurring as it goes down the spine. So I thought that was super cool. Pulled it out and read the back, and it was intriguing enough that I decided to take it home with me. I think it only has like a 3.5 on Goodreads, but that's not the worst. It is set in a girl's boarding school, and there are two main characters, Louisa and Victoria, who are studying at this boarding school, and it says their friendship is soon unsettled by a young art teacher, Mr. Lavelle, whose charismatic presence ignites tension and obsession in the cloistered world of the school. Then, one day, Louisa and Mr. Lavelle vanish without a trace, never to be found, and the book is set on the 25th anniversary of that disappearance, and there is a journalist who lived on the same street as Louisa, who goes and investigates this disappearance. Just interesting enough for me to take it home with me, coupled with a really beautiful cover design. The next one is called Brick Makers by Selva Almada and translated from the Spanish by Annie McDermott. I've never read anything by Selva Almada, but apparently she is a force in Argentinian literature, and this book is set in rural Argentina. It's about two families of brickmakers who I guess must be rivals because it says they have a mutual hatred for each other, but somehow their teenage sons of either family fall in love with each other. The back of the book says that the book begins as one of the lovers and the other lover's older brother lie dying in the mud at the base of a Ferris wheel. So that was enough to grab my attention, combined with this really cool cover art that I am absolutely in love with and kind of like bleeds into the spine of the book. It also kind of has this surreal high art look to it in a different way than Hollow. Actually, doesn't Hollow also have horses on it? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I was just feeling the surreal horse vibe in the library that day. Random. Anyway, I'm, I'm super drawn to both of these books. There's something about surreal horses really gets me excited, apparently. And then the last one, I'm sure you've heard of it, I certainly have heard of it, is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This was longlisted for the Women's Prize in fiction, I'm pretty sure, uh, recently, like last year or the year before, I don't know. Time escapes me in a pandemic. And it sounds super interesting. I'm interested to read a book dedicated to detransitioning. So it looks like it's about Reese and her girlfriend, Amy, who are very much in love. But then Amy detransitions and becomes Ames, and everything kind of falls apart for Reese. She, it says, is caught in a self destructive pattern, avoiding her loneliness by sleeping with married men. It follows up to say that Tori Peters brilliantly and fearlessly navigates the most dangerous taboos around gender, sex, and relationships, gifting us a thrillingly original, witty, and deeply moving novel. It's actually a debut novel, and so this definitely seems like a courageous leap into the literary genre for Tori Peters. It sounds like delicate issues are going to be discussed in a complex way, and I am here for it, so I also really hope I read this one. Man, going back over these books makes me really want to read all of them, so... I'm gonna have to renew every single one of these books and read every single one of these books. Maybe you will see a Morgan Reads the books that she hauled from the library reading vlog. 
That's all I have for you today, though. If you, like me, are working on your PhD and occasionally feel extremely overwhelmed and like you're never going to be able to finish, imposter syndrome settles in and sadness prevents you from working, my advice to you is go to the library. If you're doing a PhD, there's a high chance that you are a reader like myself, and just being in the presence of all of these texts and words that you one day might be able to consume and introduce into your own vocabulary, I think that will brighten your mood. So if you're not working anyway, take a jaunt down to your local public library and give them the support that they need in exchange for the happiness that you need. This video has not been sponsored by my public library, but I do love them very much. And I love their book selection. See you in another video soon.